Hey, what's up? It's Jesko from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. And I've got a really special episode for you today because I am joined by Shane Ivers. Shane, thanks for coming on and talking to me. No problem. Glad to be here. And uh, super happy to have you. And the, um, the reason that we basically jumped on this call is because you sent me a video that you made on your YouTube channel about yeah. building out your studio after following my courses, well, Build a Better Bass Trap, although you, you use GIK panels in the yeah. end and absorber placement hacks for odd rooms to plan out all the treatment. Yeah. And, um, and I really wanted to share this with you because Shane did a, such an amazing job, especially in the video where you documented what happens with the acoustics, with every kind of new panel that you put in the room with measurements. And uh, I'm going to chop in bits and bobs from that video in here as well. But uh, for, for anybody who wants to watch the whole thing, I'll link it in the description as well. And one of the main reasons why I wanted to show this to you is because you're working from a, well, a very small room, Shane, very right? Very small bedroom, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and this is a great example of, uh, of what is possible in rooms like this, all right? Um, and so if you guys want to follow along, by the way, with the process that Shane went through and that I teach, I've got a free guide for you. This is my home studio treatment framework, my five steps to treating a room and getting it to translate that I'll link in the description. These are the main steps that I want you to go through as you build out and treat your studio in order for you to not like turn in circles and end up doing stuff that you may want to then redo. This is basically the five men's main steps that I think you need to follow in order to successfully treat your studio. So again, if you want to follow along with what Shane did and what we're going to walk through in this video, check that out at the link in the description. So first of all, Shane, to, to start off with, can you maybe tell me a bit about the work that you actually do and kind of the past rooms that you've worked in or worked from and now moving to this room, what the main goal was for you with this room? So I'm a multimedia composer. I think I'm best known for releasing Creative Commons tracks. Um, so anyone can use it for background music or you know, foreground music. I'm not going to. I'm not going to judge. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's been the culmination of my education and my passion in music that started a long time ago, 20 years ago. Um, I started messing around with Cubase, uh, gotcha. little crappy Dell monitor speakers that came packaged with a and. You kind of Ace. carried on from there. About 2010, yeah. I got a bit more serious with it, started investing money and equipment, didn't really know what I was doing. Went to uni and that saw me through pretty much all of that. And then after uni, I got my, my Yamaha monitors, which I still use now, so they're still going strong. And uh, gone through various different rooms, corners of bedrooms being the most common. Sure, yeah. <laughs> then, I, then the last one was in my living room. Another, uh, yeah, I just whatever space I can get, not necessarily very good. I always knew mm -hmm. the acoustics weren't great, but I, I worked primarily on headphones. Not that gotcha. I, I prefer working with speakers, it's just easier and it's just mm -hmm. a, it's a more enjoyable experience. I'm sure you'll probably agree. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Make, making judgment calls is good once you've got a, a good system set up. So yeah, yeah. That, was, that was kind of my thing. And then I found you through uh -huh. um, the present day productions guys. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, because uh -huh. they had a thing. I think it was based on your bass hunter technique, and I thought, oh, that looks really good. Uh -huh, yeah, and yeah. I was watching that, and then they had an interview with you, and then I started watching your stuff and see, you know, you've got that that course, and I thought, I'm, I'm, I've got to get that. Excellent. I knew I was going to be moving into a new room soon, so yeah, really appreciate it. Brief history. And so this basically this room came came about, or like this, you had this uh, the option for this room, so you were just like, okay, this is going to be my new studio. Um, yeah, so it, it's just a bedroom in a house. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew I'd be moving out at some point. Didn't know what room I'd have at the time. I had already bought mm -hmm. the course because I knew I thought the information was going to be useful anyway. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, then, off, you know, browsing around the housing market, finding the right one. Sure. And, well, finding a studio space wasn't the top priority, just somewhere to live. And this happened to be, you know, probably the most suitable room to use. And yeah, so then I started planning. Sure. What what kind of what did you have in mind when you set out planning in terms of like goals to achieve? What 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 were like the main kind of I wanted uh, a goals dedicated that you really wanted to space. Get to? Yeah. I think first and foremost a dedicated space where I could 
not have to worry about leaving cables trailing around if I if I need to, you know, if you've got projects lasting multiple days, if not right. weeks. And I also wanted somewhere where I could fully treat acoustically because I've like never had that before. And it's always been a bit of a goal of mine because right. I don't know, it's it's kind of, you know, the journey there is as enjoyable as the final kind of finished studio. The building mm -hmm. process is is I've always enjoyed that. And I knew I'll definitely enjoy doing this, and it is a very satisfying process to do. Right, I, I agree. Like, I mean, it's the the difference noticing the difference before and after when you just first enter the it's room and you're just like, yeah. and then you actually go through the process, and afterwards you realize just how far you've come. Uh, and so it's, much it's, you're hearing so much more detail that you didn't think was even possible. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me a bit about this particular room then. I mean, it's an attic room. You've got a slanted ceiling. There's kind of a yeah, little so corner in the back with the door. Yeah, so it's a bit of a weirdly constructed house with um, a low roof. So it's just the the, the standard um, first floor. It's right. about three meters by two point four meters, okay. um, with a little gap where the where the door is, and yeah, a, a slanted uh, roof with one of those Velux windows in. Yeah. So yeah, that was my first kind of thing, and and, and I started modeling that room out. So I could mm -hmm. actually move the the base traps around in three D space to see what yeah. would actually physically fit. And, and so and so obviously uh, before that even I guess you went through the base hunter technique to find your listening position. Can you yeah. just talk to me a bit about that and what that was like and what you kind of found as you we were going through it? Yeah, so I tried to well a bunch of familiar songs. I was using uh, Muse quite a bit of some okay. bass lines that go all over the place and then sure. i was also using sign warbles i had my uh -huh. speaker in the corner uh -huh. so basically it was the first thing i did after clearing out the all the junk that was in the room speaker in the corner um uh, computer in the other corner and had it going mm -hmm. and i got my chair measured out to find the very kind of middle space i, I had already decided to that the most kind of acoustically symmetrical was facing the slope Yep. but not necessarily not going the long long ways because I had one slope that side and then that side it may have probably caused a bunch of issues that yeah could just be easily mitigated by going this way um yeah head by the wall to see how bassy that was it was pretty bassy uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then just I think going quite fast to begin with and then honing in slowly slowly on the area and like tiny movements I'm trying uh -huh. to move like a centimeter uh -huh. see what difference it makes another centimeter and gradually it kind of honed into one spot that seemed even nothing was poking out too much nothing was disappearing right. And, did you did yeah, you actually not, try facing the the short side or did you just like say from I did the beginning try. you know what I'm not gonna even try I did try but I thought it's not gonna work and right. I don't think I would have been able to treat it as well. It would have been a bit more of a palaver to yeah. actually attach the, the panels and try and make them symmetrical. But it would have been doable, I think. But yeah, no, I think I think you did. You 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 are you're spot on with that decision because ultimately, with these rooms that were never built to be a studio, you kind of have to make a decision up front yeah. about how you want to use the space and what makes sense in terms of using the space. Yeah. And obviously this whole symmetry thing comes into play as well. But then based on that, you can rule out what might be an option uh, and just say, you know what, this, okay, this might work, but I don't actually want to do that. And yeah. then you you choose an axis that actually works for you and find the best spot on that axis, right? Yeah. And th I mean, they were the only two possibilities because the other one had sure. the door, which I didn't really want because then that would involve you know, perhaps building a bit of a gobo thing and moving it yeah. out every time I wanted to come in and out, and that would have just really annoyed me. Yeah, so they, yeah. they were the kind of the only two viable options, and I went for symmet symmetrical. And so then, so then, obviously, next step would be setting up the speakers. What was your first yeah. impression when you then first went went about actually setting those up, finding the stereo image, finding the stereo sweet spot? Um, talk to me a bit yeah, about that. The, not super impressed because it still didn't sound that great. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, yeah, the room was not. It was a bit too reverberant and disturbing. Yeah. Um, but I did get a good um, phantom image in the center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not quite an equilateral triangle. It's the distance between the speakers is greater than between me and either of the speakers. Yeah. But that kind of worked out, and uh, to me, it sounds this sounds great. 
So it's okay. yeah, a little bit of experimentation, trying to get them a bit further away from the wall. So I, I'd have space for the base traps and the gap. You know, sure. Trying to push it back as far as I could, but not yeah. not too much. And yeah, settled on something that works quite well. Now talking about actually planning the treatment, yeah. with the room as it is, what were kind of the main challenges that you were facing when you were thinking through the the the, the positioning of all the panels? So the slope was mm -hmm. kind of a bit of a limiting factor, and some of the dimensions didn't work quite well for um, the dimensions of the base traps. And I, if I'd have followed and the the build a better base trap system, I could have probably made them slightly shorter if I could be bothered to cut all of the um <laughs> whatever <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah so I think building out the thing in three as a 3d model was really helpful and then mm -hmm. putting a bunch of is basically just elongated cubes to mm -hmm. represent all the base traps in, in the right dimensions sure. and I the, the first few iterations I everything was covered so I've got this window in front of me here um i'd covered that and i had um i suppose what did you say landscape rather than portrait uh base mm -hmm. traps underneath the uh the ones to my left and right and behind me mm -hmm. but i did make the decision for practicality i do need some space to put stuff and it's not that big of a room so yeah compromises and i wanted the window just because it's nice to have a bit of sunlight sure. so i thought yeah, yeah totally that's kind of three base traps down which is not ideal For practicality's sake, I think it's just I, one of those. It's just one of those compromises that you have to make at some point, right? You just yeah. have to prioritize, and at some point, you have to ask yourself, "Do I prefer light, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or good sound? You know, do I like to breathe or not?" So, sort of yeah, thing, you know, and it's uh, those are some very practical decisions that we have to make when we're treating when we're treating these small rooms, right? Yeah. Um, so, as you were walking through this process you documented the entire thing so that actually means that you placed single panels in the room took measurements put more panels in the room took me measurements yeah um did like did anything surprise you during that process as you were going through that and particularly talk to me about that first base trap that you put in the corner that seems yeah, to have made that, such a great impact i don't uh, know why things, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, that, so that's one i had originally in my old studio uh -huh. and that it it um i think it's the they're monster base trap but it has it mm -hmm. has the diffusion you can't see it because it's 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 behind the it's behind the, it, yeah. the material and so yeah that was the first because i already had that on hand the other stuff was all mm -hmm. on order i thought I'll, I'll put that up and then i'll do some measurements just before mm -hmm. and after just for my own curiosity i didn't think it would make any difference at all right but it actually knocked out a good amount of um in the waterfall charts yeah quite a a chunk and i was quite surprised because one i didn't think because you know usually more is more in terms of porous it absorption is. and yeah yeah it, it it was quite impressive yeah and it, it really knocked down like a, a peak that you had somewhere in, in kind of the 100 hertz area yeah um and just for everybody watching i think this is a, a first of all a, gr a great example of what might be possible but it's also uh, kind of the the exception that proves the rule because this can happen if you just if it so happens that you put the panel or the panel happens to be in exactly the spot where things happen acoustically that or, it yeah. really that it can really work uh, do its work. But uh, this is definitely not standard that you just see that kind of effect no, from one panel. It was pure fluke as well because that was just that's where I planned to put that panel, right? And I put it there, and that just happened to be you know. Quite I bet you were area. pretty happy when you saw that. Yeah, I was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then, so like, and then with the the following panels, how did like talk to me about that? Like, uh, what what kind of happened dur during the next steps? I, it it was less profound a change, but mm -hmm. it was still a positive change. So then mm -hmm. I put the two uh, to my left and right corners mm -hmm. on the ground, and you know, they every little bit I added made a bit more of a difference and a bit more of a difference and yeah those ones i think i mean i didn't spend you know a great deal of time listening um mm -hmm. while they were there because i had the other ones ready to go in sure and so i don't think i noticed that much of a difference right. for those next ones that went in 
by the time I had got the three that are behind the computer screen on the front wall, that I really started hearing a difference, especially mm -hmm. with the kind of, you know, the slapback echo and mm -hmm. the high end kind of nastiness and ringing. Sure. It was almost gone. Yeah. Even with the sloped ceiling. Mm -hmm. And I think because that those are quite far away from the wall as well, because of, there's a radiator behind there, so I couldn't put them close to the wall anyway. Right. But, you know, away from the wall is going to be a good thing mm -hmm. to just you know absorb a bit more in the low end as well. So when those three went in, I think that's when I kind of felt, yeah, I can definitely hear this is this is working. Was was that kind of the the main kind of surprise for you, or like was there a, a particular surprise or like an aha moment that you didn't realize was going to happen? Is there something in particular that stands out to you that you noticed that you weren't expecting? Um, definitely f further on, I think once I'd completed more of the room and actually spent some time listening and mixing, there are things I'd never heard before, mm -hmm. especially in bass transients that have changed the way that I mix and master things. Huh. And it was like, it was like in, I don't know, inaudible, invisible. It's not like a thing that was conceptually there for me. And now just those, you know, the very kind of transience of bass is, is there. And then it's like, oh, that sounds good. I'll have to keep them yeah. in. I, and I've listened to my old tracks and they're kind of, I think I probably pushed the masters to, you know, the limiters too much and then you kind of lose some of that detail. So it's changed the way I hear things. And that's, I mean, ultimately that's what we want, right? Yeah. Um, it's gaining that greater detail without a noticeable increased effort, right? It's just kind of, yeah. now it just jumps out at you. And it's yeah. just like, it's like, well, okay, apparently I can now hear this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, that's I'm definitely up for another um, change of that magnitude. Hopefully, when yeah. I get, I'll get new monitors some, at okay. some point. Yeah, did you have like something in mind it. already? But you know the ones you use, the head ones? Yeah. I don't remember the names. That it's some, the head a, a type three, 20. Mm -hmm. A, th a three-way um, yep. monitor and a sub. I quite like the Neumann ones as well. Yep. They're very similar spec in specification. Mm -hmm. Just depends what I can afford and whether I can find somewhere where I can go and have a little bit of a listen beforehand. Sure. But yeah, yeah, I yeah. think I mean, that'll make a difference. So many good three-way monitors out there now, and they're getting cheaper and cheaper as well. Yeah. So uh, I think there's there's no reason why why if you're doing an upgrade from a, a two-way system, not there's no reason not to go three-way these days. Yeah. Uh, just because uh, it's it's well within the budget these days, and the quality increase you get from that extra driver tends to be significant. Yeah. And and I'm quite keen to try the phase alignment thing because. Yeah, I think your Vizio said that that's another wow moment that you never want to go back. Yeah, it's quite. I mean, I've I just saw who was it at uh, Nam? Somebody pre presented. Was it PSI? Oh, is or was it uh, Cali Audio? Somebody pre presented a new speaker that now has that integrated as well, and um, I'm not surprised. It's it's a super subtle effect, but in terms of detail, the what you win is yeah. uh, incredible it's it's not it's not noticeable so much in uh, like switching it on and off but then working with it is a whole other thing and um, yeah i wouldn't be surprised if it just becomes a standard at some point uh, yeah because with dsp it's going to happen you know yeah. it's so easy to do and um but coming back to to the build out yeah um so how long did this entire process take you from start to finish now what, what did you say Probably about three months mm -hmm. because I had to do it in two phases just okay. because I couldn't afford to buy all of them at one time. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it probably would have been quicker if I'd have built them myself. And right. It just wasn't feasible mm -hmm. for me at yeah, the time. Yeah, necessarily, but it can be, yeah. Yeah, it would have taken me a long time because yeah. I have no experience in woodworking and I would have, yeah, I want it to be all nice and perfect and sure. neat and I'm sure I would have tearn out big chunks of wood if I'd have done it. Um, sure. Yeah, about three months. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Soon as I got the kind of because I had planned it, I suppose that's not including the planning stages. That's from kind of delivery of the first okay. base track. So planning, okay. I probably spent two months on and off fiddling. Right. Yeah. With the room because uh, I didn't have <clears throat> proper dimensions until a bit later. I had rough dimensions from the um, 
the the listing so i i, I got gotcha. and some of it was just memory so i thought i can start getting a rough idea but then okay. once i moved in i got the measurements exact and and kind of played around a bit more to see what could actually fit in without interfering and it's a bit difficult on 3d modeling because sometimes you know what is there in reality is not actually possible yeah so when things can just clip through each other nice and easy i can't yes. do that in reality unfortunately it would have made life a bit easier but yeah yeah totally <laughs> But so basically, from the pro from the moment you kind of got into the room, and you actually yeah. started installing things, how long did that all that take? I think the first phase, which is the stuff that's not on the ceiling, only took me probably about two days, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of the the base traps behind me aren't actually attached to the wall. I put little furniture legs on them, mm -hmm. um, so I could just rest them up, and I thought it worked actually really quite well. Mm -hmm. they're, they're stable enough um so that made that a lot quicker um these side ones and behind me not that yeah that probably was another day of making sure the measurements measuring about three or four times because <laughs> i'm paranoid that i'm gonna uh not get them in the right place and yeah so probably about two days for the phase one the probably three days for everything above me because it was just a bit more fiddly yeah, 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 and I had to use some different tools to try and attach the things, especially to the slopey walls. Yeah. Um, and just the physical maneuvering of these massive panels in place. They're not that, they're not super heavy, but they're big. Yeah, they're big. They're and bulky. there was hardly any wiggle room at all. It was like, yeah. you know, a puzzle to try and slide yeah, each yeah, one yeah. in and then, yeah. So, is there anything you would do differently now from what you learned going through that process in terms of just installing everything? Um, um, I don't think so. I think yeah. for for this space, it worked all right. Okay. Um, there probably are better ways if you know what you're doing. I'm not a joiner, and I I sure. did attach a, a beam to the to the ceiling. Right. Attached to 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 the cross beams in 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 the attic. So that they're they're solid, but that took me quite a while because I don't really know what I'm doing. Yeah, I had to kind of make a load of little pilot holes to find where the the joist was, and then work out by measuring in the attic how far the next one along was, and that. But as, as far as the methodology of securing it, it's quite good. And I was I used I used the the GIK off the shelf brackets that they have, so mm -hmm. it's, it's very easy. Just they just slide in, and it, I mean, it's a custom made fitting for just this purpose so right 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 that made yeah. it easy okay i think it might be nice to have something that actually i can move uh-huh you know just so i could tweak it up and down you know right. on a little rope or pulley just so i can get get it just right i don't know if that's Take tons of measurements while you're at it and just like eh, yeah, eh, eh. I, yeah, yeah i think i'm a bit too obsessed with the actual process of the build yeah. i enjoy that too much that it I'm not actually fun. doing any work at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is fun. It's kind of, it there comes fun. that moment where you have to kind of let go and say, all right, back to making music, right? Yeah. Because it is it is quite fun. And you can go really, really deep down that rabbit hole. Um, so, and in terms of the, actually the, the the measurements, you, I mean, you you did a great job showing the, the frequency response and the waterfall yeah. in the, in, in uh, from REW, from Rumi Q Wizard. Yeah. How how was it for you working with that software, looking at all that data? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd not used it before, so okay. I mean, to to begin with, it was a bit didn't know what to do, and, and I and I was trying to. I I got the um, the mic came with what are they called the people who the sonar works people. Uh, so sound came, ID. Sound what ID. You yeah, you're right. Yeah. That's the one, isn't it? Yeah, Sound ID, and it came with a little bundle with the software and the mic. Mm -hmm. So that had some calibration data with it, mm -hmm. and it's, I don't know how good it is because they do it at like a forty-five degree offset. Okay. That's the calibration, not directly on. And I was using okay. it directly on. Mm -hmm. So there might be some, and then I I, I ran um, calibration through my um, my interface in case that coloured it slightly. It was pretty flat. Yeah. Um and all of that. And then just playing around, pointing at things, making the the warbles and the, the sweeps. Uh just uh, I think and once I found the, the smoothing, mm -hmm. that made it definitely a hell of a lot easier because it's right, just right, right. a big 
big it's like a comb you know it's yeah like, i can't yeah, yeah. i don't know it's what's going on there so once i think, I got, I think sorry I, go ahead so once i got that kind of uh, and gone through all of them i think it was like 6 db average well not 60 but you know 6 db per octave or maybe it was 12 to me it looks like yeah. something like 12 12 yeah. or 6 per octave yeah mm -hmm. um yeah uh, the once i could actually get those it was like oh yeah that's quite it, it's 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 classic open source software very powerful not necessarily the best user interface so I mean, if you if you've never had a look at any other acoustic measurement software, yeah, then then you might think that, but it is actually very is easy to use okay. in comparison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, enough. it's still a complicated piece of software. It's very powerful and it does a lot yeah, of stuff. Yeah. And obviously, you need to understand what you are doing in order to use it. Yeah. But it is surprisingly easy to use in comparison to some of the software out there. I mean, like some I of that out there is like literally you won't even be able to get a measurement yeah. uh, <laughs> unless you read the manual first, you know? Yeah. So um, I'm always uh, really happy to, to to do a quick measurement with RoomEQ Wizard. And uh, again, yeah. you did a, I think you did a, the point I'm getting is you did a really good job um, measuring, but also just documenting the process and then showing it. Showing yeah. both the because, because what is great in your video is that we see the frequency response or the uh, yeah the frequency domain and the time domain with the waterfall yeah. plot to see to see what happens in both of those because you always want to look at both uh, yeah. which is great people focus way too much on the frequency response yeah when, which is I do think the waterfall response makes a more when that looks good it's generally quite it's much easier to work with. I think you can work perhaps with little peaks and troughs as long as you know, but once it starts resonating, then everything gets smeared and it's difficult. Totally. Yeah. And it tells you a lot more, or it tells you as much about how the room sounds be as does the frequency response, because obviously yeah. that's just kind of tonality, if you will. Yeah. While when we're talking about the decay, the reverb, all the stuff, the mushiness that happens yeah. from actual reverberation that doesn't show in the frequency response and uh, and so it's much it's, it's great to look at both at the same time and yeah. i love how you put that all together i might actually steal that for a video at some yeah, point yeah, right? yeah. you put that together <laughs> and you did a, such a fantastic job um i think what a lot of people are probably wondering is how much did this cost you all all of it from start to finish what will you say how remember. much was the investment if you're willing to share obviously it was yeah several maybe about three thousand pounds yeah probably a bit more what with yeah. all the little bits of tools and things mm -hmm. it was um yeah not cheap going but, that far does take some money right yeah i mean that's the reality of it um uh, it doesn't take 10k thankfully no. uh, yeah. but uh, a few thousand dollars euros pounds yeah. whatever that's that's that uh, that's what it takes to go to this yeah. and then i mean this length it belongs to me now if i move to a new space they still that's right i can use them again repurpose them that's right yeah so yeah it's it's not like they're going to be kind of go out of date sure it's like software or something might do totally yeah yeah, yeah. and i think that's one of the great things of working modular like this as well right? yeah um and potentially the only way you can really do it in a small room like that as well. Definitely, um, yeah. Just a quick shout out to GIK, obviously, since they, they supplied you with all the panels, and I know yeah. that they work fantastically well. Um, yeah. What made you choose which particular panel you were going to use? Did they get, did you get them involved in the process? No, I, I chose the Monster Bass Traps because they were, in terms of depth and size, pretty much identical to your your that's instructions right. in that's right yeah in terms of dimensions they're about 15 centimeters deep mm -hmm. could perhaps be a bit deeper but they're very very similar yeah. um i did have to go with slightly smaller ones on the slopes because it, the, i just couldn't fit them in so they are just mm -hmm. their standard i think 244 panels right. they're about six or seven centimeters deep sure but that's all i could fit in there so that's all you can fit yeah yeah, yeah. And those behind you, what are those? Those are, I can't remember off the top of my head. They're not monster base traps, but they're, I think, the same, except for they've got this this um, MDF diffuser on front. Right. And I know they do ones that are proper mathematical diffusion. These ones are mm -hmm. ones that just look good. But <laughs> I think they, they do some. 
They will do something for sure. They'll do something, yeah, yeah, yeah. but then yeah, yeah. yeah I, uh, I can find out, and you can put it in the description what they're. What they're that's, that's a good point. Or, or yeah, I can we'll, have a look we'll put a list to uh, we'll put a list to the the different panels that you used in the description as well. Yeah. Um, what I'm really interested in more than anything, apart from what you just told us, is you've been working from that room for a month now, month and a half, something like that. Oh, a bit longer than that. Um, long? okay. it, took me so, just... it took me so long to put the video together. Gotcha. Along with other things. Uh, I've been working here for eight months, maybe. Okay, well, even better, because yeah. that that what I what I want to ask you is with that experience now in the room, you already mentioned something that before about base transients, but with that experience now working in the room, yeah, what can you tell me about like things that you've noticed over time that changed in how you hear things, how you work, um, what works particularly well, maybe also things that still don't quite work so well. Okay. Um, it's definitely a night and day difference to what I was previously working in, and it makes the speakers, the monitors the system, sound like brand new. It's almost like right. buying the acoustics is like buying a brand new set of monitors Amazing. they're the same but different more detailed and um i can trust what i hear mm -hmm. a lot better mm -hmm. and i'm quite used to working on headphones just because of the limitations before there's not such a stark difference between headphones off and headphones on obviously i'm getting all those little details in in the headphones but it's less fatiguing to work with and I always wanted that because I always knew it's it's just easier and nicer. You you can got you've got the I think it's easier to judge the stereo field. Speak um, headphones are a bit meh. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's tricky. Can be tricky. Yeah. Yeah. So it's I found by looking back at my old mixes as well, things are standing out that I didn't know were there. Mm -hmm. They're probably over compressed. I don't think I was making perhaps the best decisions because I just mm -hmm. it was not something I was aware of so I was probably pushing things a bit too far and removing detail that I now know is there I was like oh why did I do that <laughs> sure. so it's, it's quite a quite a big difference and it's yeah it's, it's easier to work with it it's less fatiguing uh -huh. I'm using I've got this little mono block my Aventone mix cube mm -hmm. um, I used to use that more often now I, I much more rare that I do that just because the system is so well balanced, at least to my ears now, compared to how it used to be, I don't need I don't need as much secondary monitoring. Yeah, interesting. Yep, mm -hmm. it's always good, but you can just I just trust it much more mm -hmm. that it, it's it's going to translate. Right. And uh, do you still do you still go out and reference somewhere else uh, before you kind of finalize or? Are you um, even up to that point where you're, you're kind of happy with what you get from your speakers? Depends. If it's um, a proper paying client, yes, I'll go and monitor everywhere. <laughs> sure. If, if yeah, it's yeah. my free music, I do try and I, I'll listen to it on um, earbuds. I'll listen yeah. to it on the TV downstairs because yeah. I'm kind of used to those. Sure. Um but probably not the same level of care and attention that I should give them. <laughs> but I, I think they sound fine. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. What about um, like the speed of work? Has your 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 speed of working improved in any way? Yeah, that's definitely. <clears throat> it's easier to make a decision, and little changes, subtle changes, are now not so subtle. What mm -hmm. was a subtle change before, now is. A big change you know little tweaks in you know 2 db bell in the iq in the eq i i can hear that which probably i wouldn't have heard outside of the headphones before right yeah and definitely it's the transients that have made the biggest difference to me mm -hmm. um everything's punchier mm -hmm. i think the mix works nicer because there's there's just more dynamic and there's yeah it, it's it's quicker it sounds better. There's no. It's kind of no downsides. It's more fun as well, right? That yeah, makes it. Yeah. You become more confident in in the 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 changes that you do, uh, because you know kind of what you're doing actually 
is happening in the music. Yeah. And uh, and it just makes it more fun, right? You can yeah. just kind of dive in without thinking about it too much. Yeah. What about reverbs, think... delays, spaces, all that stuff? Yeah, they're much more crisp um, and they're more spacious than they mm -hmm. were. You almost, you can get 3D, you know, far beyond the speakers and uh, yeah, and it's easier to get the levels right. And I've started messing. And I normally I used to have reverb out on a bus and kind of you know tweak the uh -huh. reverb a bit. And now I'm playing with the reverb, adding distortion, adding you know yeah. cross feeding that into other delays and things which I didn't do before because it didn't really make much of a difference. But now it does. Yes. Now you so can I've tell. Got, kind of opened up a whole new kind of creative realm of you know effects upon effects, and you can just have a bit more fun with it. Yeah, amazing. Is there anything that you where you're still not happy though? Where you'd say, you know what, this, yeah, it's better, but this could improve. I still think the very, very sub kind of levels is not. It's it's a hell of a lot better than it used to be in my previous mm -hmm. spaces, but it's probably still not quite where I'd like it. I don't tend to make too much music that's extra extra subby anyway. Right, but it's just nice to have that there. I think, mm -hmm. and I, I don't, it's not that it doesn't sound bad or anything, it's that can I trust it? And I don't have another monitoring system that I can use easily that that reproduces anything that low. So it's kind of, I just have to accept that that's how it is. Yeah. And hope for the best, unless I want to go pay a mastering engineer for all of my tracks to go. And are you, you're using a sub, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the the Yamaha sub as well. That kind yeah, of, the, the, that's paired the with them. Matched with the yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then Sonar Works. You mentioned it before. Do you? I can't remember from the video whether you talked about Sonar Works in there. You, did you? Yeah, uh, very okay. briefly. It was like my last step in the the, the okay. measurements. Okay. Somehow I so, missed that. Um, but yeah. Do you, so talk me talk to me about that. Uh, how how much does Sonar Works still do? How much do you still rely on it? Um, I think yeah. it definitely is, is. It makes an audible difference, mm -hmm. and I prefer it with it on. Mm -hmm. I have knocked out some of the um, the more extreme peaks. You can put limits, so it's it's a yeah. max of six dB rather than <clears throat> skyrocketing wherever. N luckily, none of it was that extreme. Yeah. After doing the measurements, but I didn't want it to push it too much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I did. I, is a bit of a balancing act, I think, of because uh, you can you can add more of the effect in, like you know, wet dry, one hundred percent. And I was trying to dial it back to get something, and I was trying to get it to be sort of similar to the the headphones, which I mean that they will, I will also use the the um I use it for the headphones as well. Sometimes right. I mm -hmm. toggle it on and off. I've got this piece of software called Room, which okay. Um, <laughs> It's, it's it moves things it's just it's just an audio router okay so i can click and, and it goes to my headphone amp and then i can toggle on sonar works so i've got mm -hmm. the option to just toggle things on and off when i need oh, okay. i think that's helpful okay. just to kind of i mean it, it's almost like another little monitoring option you know, it sure. changes yeah. the sound subtly and i can a b it see if i and but most of the time i'm used to it now so i leave it on mm-hmm Okay, I mean, great. It's, I think maybe maybe this is also a, a good a good jumping off point as any because I think you did such a great job with all of this. We've kind of gone through all the steps, and uh, it, I, for everybody watching, it just shows what you can do in a room this small. I mean, yeah. people come to me all the time with rooms like yours and say, "Is it even possible? Is, is it even worth trying?" And yes, absolutely, yeah. it is absolutely, worth yeah. not just trying, but you will get results if you take the right steps, right? Yeah. And and they all build on one another. It's not one that does everything. It's every single one of them that together give you what you what you need, right? Yeah, a massive cumulative effect. Even if you do have a weird outlier like me, carry on going. Yeah. <laughs> Don't stop there because it will get even better and even better. Yeah. And you, you won't regret that. It's amazing. It's it's definitely it's changed everything.
Yeah, amazing. Well, Shane, I hope you have plenty of great music coming from your room and uh, so. <laughs> spend many years, hopefully, of, of uh, good time making music in the room. Yeah. Um, thanks for sharing uh, with okay. us today. And um, yeah, for everybody watching, like I said, we've got all the links to both the Home Studio Treatment Framework at the in the description. We've got the links to your video, which yeah. I, I really recommend checking out because you did such a great job documenting that process and it's super interesting to see. And then also the links to the GIK panels. Um, Shane, thanks again. And- You're welcome. <laughs> thanks very much. <laughs> Cheers, bye, bye, bye.